Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. You may not recognize the name Green Bites, but it belongs to one of the fastest growing tech firms in Rhode Island. The six-year-old company is a leader in virtualization, which lets organizations use their IT infrastructures more efficiently. Greenbytes recently landed an additional $7 million from investors, including a fund co-founded by former Vice President Al Gore. This week on Executive Suite, Greenbytes Chairman and CEO Steve O'Donnell, plus Food Glorious Food. A new nonprofit kitchen incubator has a big plan to help culinary entrepreneurs, plus a former school in Warren and a seven-figure federal loan to get it off the ground. On the second half of Executive Suite, the founder and executive director of Hope in Maine, Lisa Rayola. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I want to welcome to the show Steve O'Donnell. He is uh, CEO of Green Bites, which I mentioned off the top. And Steve, thanks for being here. Please, and I want to start with a somewhat embarrassing admission. Uh, I'm not proud of it, but I was struggling to explain to people what Green Bites does. Um, one of the uh, Providence Business News explanations was they do inline deduplication data storage solutions, which might not slip off the tongue of people sure. at home. So when you're talking to, to folks who aren't experts in this, how do you describe your company and what you do? Okay. The IT industry has been creating vast amounts of data for decades. And I don't know if your viewers will realize, but in the last three years, we've created more data than has ever been created in all time. It's growing at 40% compound annual growth rate every year. And so the amount of money and the amount of data center space that's required to support all this growth is quite gargantuan. And that data is everything from photos on my iPhone yeah. to company records to yeah. anything. Right, and you know, you think about it, the, the number of pixels on your iPhones got bigger, you've got high definition TV, um, you've got higher quality images, you've got higher quality uh, animations, all these things take more and more space and people, they're not, they don't have photographs anymore. Do you have a photograph album? I bet you don't. <laughs> no. You probably have a Flickr account and you store your, your pictures up there and your Facebook account, how many photographs have you got on that? So there's huge amounts of data and the thing about the data is it's it's not really only stored once. So if you take a, a picture of your family on holiday and you send it around to your 50 best friends, there's 50 copies. So that's insane. What our, t our technology does is it deduplicates the storage. So we only store one copy. Everybody appears to have their own copy, but there's only one really stored. And it can make a dramatic difference to the amount of storage that's required the amount of energy and electricity that's required to keep the thing alive and uh, all of the capital equipment that's required. And we do this in line. That is, there are really two approaches. One approach is that you throw all, the, all these images and, and files into a, the great big bucket that's your storage controller. And afterwards, you go through and you find everything that's duplicate and you throw away the stuff that is a duplicate, just keeping one copy. That's slow. Um, and it's That's how I manage my own email inbox. Right. <laughs> In fact, it's like clearing out the attic. Okay? Right, right. It's exactly like that. What we do, though, is we stop it getting bad in the first place. In line, we identify, ah, oh, we've already got that one. We don't need to store it. And we throw it away, and we just keep a link, a pointer, to say that there should be a copy for Fred or a copy for Ted or a copy for Steve, and just one copy gets kept. And that's how we work. It's, it's uh, kind of like magic. But, um, and we do it using modern technology, we patented this technology, so it's you know it's, it's Rhode Island engineering developed here, patented and used internationally to, to reduce the amount of storage that the world is using. And so, um, who are your customers? It sounds like it could be almost anybody, but of course, especially okay. in the corporate sector or big universities and those types. Who there's been a great demand for your services. Who is it? Well, one of our customers is Brown University, actually locally uh, to us, but. Let me take it a, a stage further. This is fundamental technology. It's really, really important. So we've been going after the, the major IT vendors like IBM, like Dell Computers, like Fujitsu, the Asian uh, uh, computer manufacturer. So we're going after these large guys to integrate our technology into their base technology. So we're looking for high volumes where our technology integrated into a solution that, that really helps the, the global community to reduce the, the carbon footprint 
of, um, of data. That's fascinating. So you have um, raised quite a bit of money from yeah, private yeah. investors in recent years. You just had a $7 million Series C. Those investment rounds are A, B, C. They're labeled right. as you get each one. And uh, Al Gore, was a firm he co-founded, was involved. Um, what's attracting these investors in, and, and what have you been able to show them? Well, you know, storage um, is such a growth industry, and investors like high growth industries. And we really solve this difficult problem because we're able to reduce the costs and yet still uh, support this enormous growth in storage. Um, Generation Investment, uh, which is Al's firm, um, uh, basically uh, came in with our e existing investors who are Battery Ventures, they're, they're a local firm based in Massachusetts, and the two together have actually put in $20 million inside the last 12 months. So they're really seeing the opportunity um, for this local company to, to grow and become a real big global player. It's all these, these issues of efficiency and how we use uh, right. our, our virtual powers and, and, and everything yeah. right now. You know, in much the same way that Providence, um, I mean, my, my, my office is in the Brown and Sharp factory, right, in, in Promenade Street in Providence. And these guys actually made the tools that drove the Industrial Revolution in America. So we're doing much the same thing. We're building software tools that are, is driving the, the software industrial revolution. Um, and we hope that we can re rekindle engineering in Providence. And is it the kind of thing where your software or your, and yeah. your hardware is working if people aren't really noticing it at the, at the final stage? Absolutely, so it's, it's completely transparent. You know, you, you plug into your broadband router at home, you don't even know it's there. Probably your kids don't know it's there. But it works, and we're exactly the same. We're invisible technology that just makes things work better. And you know, there's, there's another piece, actually. Um, many of your viewers may have bought a, a, an up-to-date laptop, and they might have had flash memory in it. They might have a flash drive, may have heard, hear it called an SSD. Okay, so these are much faster. You know, if you boot your flash-based laptop, it takes a few seconds. Well, if you boot one with an old disk in it, it can take minutes. So one of the things that Greenbikes is doing is really enabling flash technology, but at the enterprise level. You know, your flash-based laptop is more expensive than your magnetic-based laptop, because the flash memory is much, much more expensive. One of the things that we're able to do with deduplication is enable uh, enterprise customers to use flash memory at less money than it costs them for the magnetic storage because we can deduplicate it. All right, we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the growth Greenbites is having and why it recently moved its offices to Providence. Mm -hmm. Stick with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and uh, later in the show, we're going to hear about Hope in Maine, a kitchen incubator in Warren that's starting up. A fascinating project there. But right now, I'm really happy to be joined by Stephen O'Donnell. He's CEO of the Providence tech company Greenbites. And uh, for those who saw the first segment, Steve, they may say that's not a Rhode Island accent. <laughs> How did no. you end up in charge of a Providence company? No, I'm from Edinburgh in Scotland originally. You know, kind of engineering based, a lot like Providence. And um, I, I came over when we got our investment from Al Gore's fir firm. Um, they asked me to be the chairman of the business originally, and then uh, as we developed and we raised more money and got more traction, they asked me to step into the, the shoes of being the chief executive. And here you are. So here I am. And how do you like Rhode Island? I love it. Smart yeah. answer. <laughs> well, you know, it's the smallest state in the union, um, but it's probably one of the highest quality places to live. I don't like the winter, but it's kind of like Scotland. It was cold and snow, <laughs> but the summer is glorious. And the fact that you can get to the beaches, the quality of life down here is just to die for. Good reminder to the people at home who are used to it. Well, and, and you know, the food, <laughs> the food here, I know you're going to be talking about that later, but yeah. the food here is amazing. <laughs> what a great city. And there might be more of it uh, coming up if food in Maine succeeds. Mm. So on Green Bites, um, you were founded down in Ashaway in yes. 2007. Um, and you've moved to Providence in 2012. Why the move? Why did you decide to come up to the capital? Okay, well, as we, you know, when, when you take a lot of investment, it's all, the investors are all looking for rapid growth. And that's all about skills. It's about getting the people. And frankly, with your back to the ocean, it's pretty hard to recruit the high quality skills that we needed. So we moved to Providence for two reasons. One, because we wanted to co-locate with Brown, Brown University. And the second is that we wanted to uh, sort of fish the the ponds of the, the southern part of Massachusetts. 
loads and loads of tech companies in New England. We wanted to bring some of those highly skilled people down to Providence, which is a really easy ride on the 95. Um, and we've done that, you know, we've really been able to double the number of people that we're recruiting and, and working with in Rhode Island. We've now got over 40 people working in our Providence office. We're an international business. We have, uh, we have offices in London, we have offices in Al Amsterdam, um, and uh, we're looking to grow um, right across the world. We've, we've got traction in Japan, um, and you know the business is just growing like topsy. So. And part of it for you guys has to be, I would assume, moving quickly, because this absolutely. need is growing so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all about people. This is a people business. It's about engineering. It's about skills. It's about support, supporting our customers. It's, it's about the manufacturing processes. It's about the quality assurance processes. All the skills that people in New England uh, working for some of the large storage and technology companies that have grown up around here have got in spades. So we're able to pull these people in and really drive the business. Let me ask you, we're talking constantly in Rhode Island these days yeah. about growing the economy, helping yeah. growing businesses like yours to expand yeah. and stay here. Uh, when you think about the challenges or the things that, that are most important to your business as you try to grow and hopefully stay here, yeah. what comes to mind? People. Only people. You know, if you've got the right technology, you can raise the money. But the most difficult thing is finding people with the right skills. Uh, and my sense is that we get so many engineering graduates coming out of Brown and they get on the bus and they go north. Um, they don't stay here because there's no work for them. And what we really need now is we need to build an ecosystem that sticks these, uh, these engineering graduates and the scientists in the region and actually builds an ecosystem around them. Look at all of the other major tech hubs in the world. They're all surrounded by top quality universities. Brown can do that. You think so? Do you have I confidence do. in the, in the yeah. plans Brown is rolling out? Well, let me put it this way. We're using Brown interns at, at Greenbites and they're high quality people. Yeah. Top people. Um, so we only have about a minute left, um, yeah. but I want to ask when you look forward, we're talking sure. about growth, growth, growth. What's, what's next for Greenbites? What do, you, what do you think about it and you look 6, 12, 18 months down the road? Okay, so we, we will be growing um, orders of magnitude in size, okay? Um, we've got the funding to do it, we've got the technology to do it, we've got the sales traction to do it. We've got great products, great people, great technology. And uh, now it's just about execution. We need to find the people to grow our business. Um, the market wants what we've got and we're going to go for it. And you think you'll stay in Rhode Island? Um, there's no reason to move. Why would we want to move? We've got, we've got a, a great catchment area and it's a great place to live. All I right, Steve O'Donnell, thank you so much for joining me. We'll be watching Green Bites to see as they keep growing. And when we come back, we're going to hear about a different sector of the economy, food, and what's happening in Warren to build up that sector. Stay with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and I'm pleased to be joined now by Lisa Rayola. She's founder and executive director of Hope in Maine in Warren. And those of you who drive through the Maine drag there in the East Bay may be familiar with that Hope in Maine sign that's been outside the old brick Main Street School mm -hmm. for, I think, about three years mm -hmm. now. But you were finally having some real, and there you can see it right there, that, that building. Uh, yeah. But you've had some real big announcements in the past couple of weeks. So just to get things started, what is Hope in Maine? Okay, so Hope in Maine is a shared use commercial kitchen. Um, sometimes it's called a kitchen incubator or a culinary business incubator. And what we're planning to do is to assist um, early stage uh, food companies with uh, their their startup process. So it's really creating an on-ramp for their businesses. So people might uh, have heard, I think we've talked about on this show before, Beta Spring, which right. does this for tech firms or right. tries to in Providence. Right. And you're sort of looking to do the same thing for, for food, give people the resources they need to start right. up. So exactly. how does the school fit in? So, right, so the school, um, the school really found me. I was not looking for a school. I was looking to start my own small food business. And I happened to be uh, looking at a property in Warren, and um, the, uh, the director of planning brought me to the school because it had been shuttered for several years. So here's this beautiful school. It's on Main Street. Almost 100 years old now. It's 1915, and it was in excellent shape. And I walked in, and I, it, I thought it's, it's, um, 
it's sort of sad that we can't think of anything to do with these old schools. Um, and symbolically, you know, I think that we're past the point where we could expect that K through 12 or even K through higher education is sufficient in our lifetime. We have we need to create lots of opportunities to reinvent ourselves. So as I was standing there, I thought, gee, maybe I can create a space where lots of people can start food businesses. And I actually thought that I had invented the idea of a culinary business incubator when this occurred to me. And when I Googled it, I found that all over the country there are kitchen incubators. Many of them in California, which is sort of where the trend was started, but some of them in the heartland because they're really serving um, agriculture and creating this opportunity for, for farmers to add value to what it is that they cultivate. Um, so really that's how the idea was born. I sort of abandoned my own idea and I thought that it would be beneficial from an economic development standpoint to create a place where lots of people could start food businesses. And people are going to think you, you have a food truck or something now, but you were actually you were an assistant professor at Brown University's right. medical school. This right. is not your, your first career no, by any means. <laughs> and you, had, you were telling me when we were talking that you found when you had an idea for a food business, it's so expensive to get that started. It is. It's, it's the food businesses are high risk businesses. Um, it's very difficult for them to get traditional financing, whether it's a restaurant or even, you know, uh, making um, with green bites were, 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 were uh, <laughs> you know, candy, right? That you, you don't easily get financing for that because um, in Rhode Island, the law is that you cannot cook out of your home and sell a product on a retail basis. You have to be in a code compliance space. So in many ways, the state likes this project because they don't want people cooking out of their homes and trying to sell them. And now that we have this great infrastructure that organizations like Farm Fresh have created where we've got 55 farmers markets, um, that's a distribution system for us. So where can we um, source products for that distribution system that's only growing? I want to dig in on the project now. Um, you, the town of Warren agreed to sell you for a small amount of money the property. The voters mm -hmm. there agree, agreed on this project. And you've got a three point, uh, I believe a three million dollar uh, loan from the U.S. Right. Department of Agriculture right. to, to get started exactly. with Hope and Maine. Yep. You have a groundbreaking coming up this month. What's going to happen to that school? What are you going to use that money for? So the, the grant is a, it's actually not a grant, it's a loan. It's Excuse a me. USDA Community Facilities Rural Development Loan. So people say, well, why Warren? Well, partly because it couldn't be Providence. Providence isn't rural. But, you know, you, you cross a bridge and you're, you're 15 miles away and suddenly you're in a place that is rural by USDA standards. So and People taking a look there at what it's going to look like when you're right. finished. So when it's finished, what you're going to have is um, three uh, commercial kitchens um, with special food processing equipment that, that uh, people will be able to use on a per hour basis. So you would become essentially a member of Hope in Maine and you would pay a monthly fee based on the number of hours that you're going to use um, your kitchen space and your uh, kitchen equipment. Um, you'd also have access to dr uh, cold and dry storage um, as well as a business center and the technical supports that you would need to start any kind of a food business. So what's going to happen in the school is three commercial kitchens, a demonstration kitchen and classroom so that we can also be um, doing some outreach in the community and doing some teaching around um, food preparation and nutrition. We'll have a 2,000 square foot event space which we could do for conferences, events and a year-round market. And then what you see in the picture that you showed is in the parking lot is a, um, is a town market concept so that we're able to say to the people that cook there that they can also um, have direct access to consumers. This is one of the toughest things um, with starting a food business is getting your product into distribution, getting it into the hands and mouths of your of your customers. Now will Hope in Maine be an investor in those startups or really they're using it like as you said a membership organization? It's a membership organization. We're a nonprofit. We are not investing although there I've had um, different investors in Providence express interest in investing in these companies as they come online because you know we're, that several of them are going to be successful just the law of large numbers. We'll be able to incubate about 50 businesses at a time. Wow. Which is which is a lot. That's a, that's and and the lot. graduation rate for incubators of this size is about fifteen percent. So fifteen percent will go on to graduate to 
um, you know, as they, as they scale up and they need larger spaces or they become more successful. So we are not investing, but I did want to mention that what we do want to do is brand the products. So we want to co-brand with the producers and say that this was made at Hope and Maine because that's provenance. And what you can then do with that is the consumer knows this was made in Rhode Island and it has sort of a halo effect. And I think people are willing to pay more and pay more attention to products that are made in Rhode Island. Now, uh, well, first of all, I should ask, is there demand? What are you hearing? It's, you know, you've been talking about it for a while, so I'd assume you've had outreach. So there is incredible demand, more than I thought. Um, we've had, without, with little outreach, we've had about 200 people express interest. Um, we will start taking formal applications in the fall, but I fully expect that we won't be able to take everybody that applies because there has been so much interest expressed in the community because there is nothing like this. There is no other place to go to, to, uh, to start a food business. How are you going to decide when you get those applications? Well, we have an admissions <laughs> committee, which is a subset of my board, which has some fantastic people who have deep experience in the food uh, business and already have some successful food businesses in Rhode Island, Pastiche, um, in Providence, I'm sure you know Pastiche. I know, um, I got, bought a cake there yeah, this weekend. The yep. Sunnyside <laughs> Restaurant in Warren, um, Fatigati Fresh Pasta in Portsmouth. Uh, there are some really talented people who have invested their time in making other people successful in the food business. Um, you know, we've done a bunch of shows about around food in the last couple of months, and a theme that came through with the farmers markets, yeah. with uh, Dave's Coffee, with uh, the uh, Daniele Foods in Burrowville is a lot of people in this sector feel like there's a real growth opportunity in around that's not being even fully uh, tapped into yet. What do you think of that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you look at some of the indicators. So, so why is Rhode Island a fertile place for this. One, you see agriculture growing at a 42% clip. It may be a bit more than that once we see the new census figures. So the number of farms has grown by 42% from between 02 and 07. The market value of food has grown 20% to about 65 million. The direct access to consumer sales has doubled in a five-year period from 05 to 2010, meaning our ability Rhode Island leads the nation, not in dollar sales, but percent of our overall food sales direct to consumer. Organic produce has grown from less than a million, I think less than 300,000 to 1.3 million. That's a 400% growth rate. There is demand. Um, for local product and locally produced product. So uh, we're just only about 10 seconds left. When are you going to be open and ready to go? So we'll probably be open in the spring. So we'll take applications in the fall. We'll make a decision on what we're calling our inaugural class right after the first of the year. And then we'll have a soft opening around April 1st. A lot of excitement yeah. down there. So people will start seeing crews and work being done Absolutely. at Hope and Maine. Absolutely. When it said coming soon, we finally defined what soon <laughs> means. Soon is finally <laughs> coming. Must yeah. be a relief to you, too. It is. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining Thank me. You, and Jeff. I want to thank Stephen O'Donnell, who was here from Green Bites in the first half of the show. If you missed any of this episode or any other episode of Executive Suite, you can find those on WPRI.com. And we'll see you back here next week on Executive Suite. Lisa, thanks so much.